Okay, good morning. I hope you enjoyed the short video and maybe uh, recognized yourself somewhere in some of the pictures. Uh, I am Jovan Brüsselen. Uh, I had the pleasure of coordinating the Global Timber Tracking Network Phase 2 for the past uh, four years. And I would just like to start this meeting, uh, which is otherwise, of course, focused on the information system, but I would like to give a short overview of the results that we have achieved together with the network uh, over this uh, time. So uh, let's have a, a quick look. Um, as uh, maybe some uh, of those following the meeting haven't been uh, in any of our meetings before, so uh, the core, the core of goal of GTTN has always been to advocate for the various methods and tools that can help identify a piece of wood. ID, that means what's on an ID, that's the, the name, so the species of the wood and, and the origin where uh, the wood came from, whether that's uh, stated on a bill of lading or in a flex license or a, a CITES uh, trading form. Uh, still, the paperwork uh, uh, should be checked uh, and verified uh, every now and then whether, whether what is mentioned there is correct. And so these scientific tools that we promote can give this in, an, uh, in a sound and biased uh, manner. Um, so we are a, we have been acting like a coordination and support activity and a key uh, component of the network has been to bring people together and share uh, ideas and expertise and to work together on, 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 uh, on the documents that I will present a bit later. In the future, maybe this could also lead to sharing infrastructure, who knows, in our global network, because uh, while we are nearing the end of phase two, so the global timber tracking network will continue in a phase three and more about that later. So, I already mentioned one of our key end user groups uh, that's uh, in, in the range of due diligence. So those from the private sector who are needing to implement um, a sound a chain of custody uh, in compliance with legislations uh, in, in uh, most of the major wood trading markets in the world. So we have the Lacey Act in the US, the EU timber regulation in Europe, um, or in the context of VPAs, for example, in Indonesia, why, uh, why not apply it as such? And then the other key end user group is the law enforcement, which comprises judiciary authorities, policing, of course, customs, CITES authorities, and so forth. Um, the global timber tracking network has seen a steady growth. We have now about 200 uh, registered members across the globe um, from a variety of backgrounds. And uh, we have seen that uh, gradually while we organized our regional workshops, uh, we, we expanded our network in the, in the regions uh, of those meetings. So there was a good correlation between these meetings and the growth of the network. And it just proves how important it is to meet people, not only in webinars in these days, uh, as we have them so often, but also face to face, hopefully again in the future. So the, this uh, breaks the statistics down a little bit and shows the different angles on our, uh, on our membership. So we have both those who uh, want to use uh, wood identification services, but mostly we assemble the providers, the laboratories, the science uh, and consulting firms that offer these services. Uh, most of our members are still in Europe, but we have seen uh, a good expansion in the Americas, in Asia Pacific and in Africa. But of course, there is, there is always uh, uh, opportunity for further widening of our network. Uh, there are many who are working on this topic who somehow we haven't been able still to include in our activities. Hopefully that goes in the future. Uh, this slide 
This is an overview of the key activities that we've been working on, and I will start with a few words only on the service provider directory and the reference database. We have also been working on guidelines and harmonization. Uh, we have done a market assessment, a priority species list, and we work on communication and advocacy. First, on the service provider directory, uh, it's like a big telephone book specialized on wood identification service providers. And the system is developed such that it connects to the reference database and uh, sees what laboratories have what uh, reference data and what types of analytical expertise. And then through a specialized query, it helps uh, interested parties to find the correct laboratory. So depending on the type of analysis questions they have, and then on the other side, depending on what the service providers or the laboratories uh, can offer. Um, this has been uh, yeah, a development that started really from the beginning of the project and we had a long time brainstorming with different uh, members on uh, the specifications for this database. And uh, so uh, they have been developed throughout the project through discussion uh, to come then to a, a really user oriented system of, of which you will hear after this presentation a lot more. So the reference database originally was developed as a separate component from the service provider directory, uh, but they are now integrated. As I mentioned in the background of the SPD, there is this reference data that helps uh, making better query results. Um, but so the reference database has a different clientele. It's really aimed at the service providers, at the wood identification professionals. So in first instance to share the metadata so to show what the different laboratories are working on to show what <clears throat> what physical samples they have maybe in store and in the best case also laboratories can share their actual reference data while always holding control over these data and deciding who can use what and when and how so uh, the University of Connecticut has been has become a major partner in this development, and uh, yeah, you will hear more from uh, from Jill Wiggersen and Peter Richter later on, who have been co-developing this uh, with uh, with our EFI colleagues uh, Simo Varis and Sergei Sutin. So we had <clears throat> this. Uh, GTTN info system workshops where we convened experts from different methods. So we had all these different views represented on how reference data should be uh, described for the different methods. Uh, we had this uh, in, we have been discussing this in all of our meetings, but we had a first uh, like info system oriented workshop in Kori in Finland in March, 2019. And then a year later, so in May this year, the system was ready for sharing back with these initial members of the task force. And then uh, after some further system improvements, so we are in this autumn now ready to really open the system to the larger community while still being open for, for uh, recommendations to improve and for further integrating the system with, with our members' uh, house-grown, home-grown systems. So this is now the third and uh, currently final uh, in our uh, info system workshop series. So, and uh, it's gonna be repeated again a couple of times that so uh, after this workshop, we will have these hands-on assistance, face-to-face uh, -face meetings. So with the organizations who really are serious about getting at least metadata or maybe their reference data into the info system. Uh, also to help the SPD function better. Apart from the reference database and the service provider directory, we also have this overview of the wood collections uh, that are connected to the International Association of Wood Anatomists, so the IAWA. Uh, we will 
uh, keep this Iawa index Xilariorum online, although we understood that Iawa is now also developing something something similar themselves. But we have to make sure that we're we're not duplicating and we're yeah synergizing and uh, yeah in that way reach more results in the end together. Now a little bit on the uh, different uh, reports that we have been working on with the network. So we had. We show four here and we go, we, we talk a bit more about five of such activities. First uh, is the general sampling guidelines, which um, are a very practical step by step guide into taking samples for the creation of reference data. Uh, this is complementary to the UNODC guidelines, which gives uh, guidance on how to take samples. Um, in a uh, legal process, uh, so in a, in a police process. So that's a, an altogether different issue. Um, the guidelines have been developed by more than 25 authors <clears throat> from more than 25 institutions. And uh, it's available, as all our reports will be, through the GTTN website, as well as uh, from the research gate. And what was really encouraging is that uh, we heard that this is already being used in practice in the field. So that's a, that's a nice step towards uh, harmonization, if not standardization in the future. Uh, and second document is the timber tracking tool infogram, which much uh, like the service providers directory uh, query system, it helps, uh, it, it represents a tree decision mode model which helps interested parties to find out which would be the suitable method to uh, analyze a certain type of product in certain types of circumstances. So uh, in, in a few pages basically it summarizes uh, this otherwise complex matter in an easily understandable way so this is aimed at, uh, at uh, the users uh, as well as uh, scientists who want to understand the capability of other methods. So this was also a multi-collaborator uh, effort with uh, 20 contributors from as many organizations. Then uh, a big report that just came out in June uh, this year. Um, one of the last uh, big uh, uh, deliverables prepared by uh, Nele Schmitz, who was, uh, of course, very active uh, person in our GTTN secretariat from the Tunen Institute. So she led his work on the overview of current best practice methods used to analyze data derived from the different wood identification methods, both concerning reference data as test sample analysis. It looks into the strengths and limitations of the different methods. And this could be a step towards harmonization of data analysis procedures, maybe. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that we were requested to look into standardization, but early on in the, in the phase two, it came clear from discussions with our members that uh, standardization was not yet in the interest, that it was too early and that at best we can uh, reach harmonization and we can elaborate on how the results from the different methods could be compared and how they could be used together maybe so to increase the accuracies of the of the approaches so to increase better accuracies than what would be reached maybe with single methods uh, being uh, used in on their own so the audience for this document is really the experts the wood ID analysts it had a big contribution from 38 authors of 30 institutions. Uh, so that was really a, a very nice networking result. Then uh, a fourth uh, report is the list of priority tree species in the first phase of the GTTN. Uh, such a list of priority species was published in 2013. So we thought that after more than five years, it's a good time to uh, revisit this and to take some different criteria into account perhaps than was done in the first round. So we looked at the prioritization 
in context of trade importance of uh, timber species, the protection status, enforcement challenges that were maybe indicated through uh, surveys with uh, police authorities uh, uh, or CITES authorities. Uh, so we did this through reviewing trade uh, and having stakeholder surveys. Uh, and we had a good cooperation from uh, CITES Secretariat and Interpol as well in, in spreading our questionnaires. Then finally, something that is still in the pipeline, as we say, so uh, due in November 2020, at the very end of this uh, second phase, would be the market assessment, which is uh, which gives an overview and assembles many of the different uh, topics we have been working on throughout this phase two. So we start uh, looking into the different legislations worldwide that call or support uh, wood identification explicitly or rather implicitly. Uh, we look at the different stakeholder types. We look at trade and trade risk uh, in the different regions of the world. We describe good identification tools very briefly, uh, include something, some information on three species priorities. Uh, we look at the capabilities of service providers and uh, explore different business models to some minor extent. So this is not a in, very in-depth exercise on that matter. And then we look at uh, potential uh, current and future markets. So this is uh, this is due next month, basically. Communication, networking, and outreach has been important from the beginning till the end, and it will continue as such. So we had these three regional workshops in Yaoundé, Cameroon in 2018, in Lima, Peru in 2018, and in Beijing, China in 2019. We had three regional webinars now, and uh, we had some global meetings as well and connected to several uh, trade fairs or uh, the Asia Pacific Forest Week, Interpol conference, the CITES plants committee and such venues. So to always discuss with often similar, but always there were new uh, experts, new types of concerns that were brought in. And this has been very useful. And I hope this will also continue in the future in a more lively manner. And then, of course, I hope you have been also receiving our newsletter or have been following the news that is more regularly updated on our website. And uh, yeah, we have also been very active with Jose, who is leading this communications activity now uh, on uh, Twitter and uh, ResearchGate. So uh, even if phase two is coming to an end, this is all, of course, going to continue. Looking forward to phase three. So we recently, some month ago, a bit over a month ago, we had a, a GTM futures webinar in uh, extended steering committee setting, where we discussed with the future coordinator on what might be the topics of interest in the next phase. And uh, so the, first of all, the coordination will be taken care of by the International Tropical Timber Organization as of the beginning of 2021. Um, they will continue more or less the activities that have been addressed in phase two, while increasing the outreach to the potential users of wood identification. So uh, that is how GTTN will resort under the uh, legal and sustainable uh, supply chains initiative and links also to the <clears throat> global green uh, supply chains. Uh, thematic uh, that is uh, addressed at the ITTO. Uh, we have from phase two been collecting ideas on what could happen in the future in our different meetings. And we have been communicating that quite many times now to donors and uh, also to the future coordinator. So, and it seems that they will, uh, they give uh, importance to the development of uh, regional hubs in what way that will be I, we don't know yet but so these regional hubs would uh, keep the debates uh, and the information exchange and maybe also uh, technology exchange and maybe sharing of infrastructure uh, within the regions and uh, so that there is a more frequent 
uh, exchange and learning process and outreach between the different stakeholders. So uh, ITTO has in the past uh, been taking care of uh, sampling campaigns of, or rather they have been contracting these out and I assume that they will also keep doing that in the future, but I would say stay tuned and hear more information from them uh, in due course. So I think now it's high time to go into the information system and I'd like to give the word to Jill Wigersen of the University of Connecticut to tell us all about it and uh, keep going to the details. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll take questions in the chat. Uh, you can type them already now and we'll address them later in the joint Q&A session. Thank you. All right, thank you, Yo. And I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen. And I think you just, there we go, perfect. <laughs> Stop screen sharing there. All right, I just wanna make sure everyone can see the screen okay. Okay, perfect. All right, so just to introduce myself, my name is Jill Wegerson. I'm at the University of Connecticut. And as Yo mentioned in his introduction, um, we've been working closely uh, with the EFI team on developing the combined reference and SPD or service providers database to serve the GTTN project. And so today I'm just gonna give you some general overview of kind of how we got here and some of the general principles and goals during the development period. And then we're gonna turn it over to Peter, who's uh, one of the developers on the Tree Genes database and now the uh, reference and SPD database for GTTN to talk to you about how it all works. And so the concepts of what we're developing today is very much based um, from our work with the Tree Genes database. This database was known as Dendrum and actually started in the early 90s, um, sort of as a standalone software package. It migrated onto a web-based format shortly after that and has been maintained over the years as an international community resource, resource for forestry genetics. And so it's taken many forms and looks uh, very different across this time period, but a consistent goal is to provide a relational model to hold genetic information, trait or phenotypic information, and environmental information about forest tree species from around the world. We also hold information on the individuals who study these trees, the papers that are published about this information, and all of this information can be queried at different levels in the database. All of these resources have been web-based for a long time. Um, it's something that's been maintained by our group and is supported by a team of developers. And a lot of the backend systems that are used to provide this information to the community were very, are very applicable to the GTTN project. And so that's largely how we got involved. One of the uh, specific tools within sort of the tree genes ecosystem is a tool we call cartography. And that tool is integrating genotypic, environmental, and trait-based data for georeferenced trees from around the world. And most of the data that's presented here and that users can interact with is coming from peer-reviewed studies or from um, individual trees that have been submitted directly to the platform. And so this is sort of an idea of what can be done um, with this type of data. Uh, this is kind of the public-facing side of our database, but this information is uh, can be queried by publication type, by traits, by region, by species. And it's also back-ended with analytical pipelines as well. And so we'll talk a little bit about the potential of this data and sort of the relational systems underlying this. So tree genes is one of about uh, a little over 35 different databases around the world that are using an open source backend uh, known as Triple. And the triple uh, ecosystem is essentially set up to provide a lot of features that are gonna be useful for organism-based databases. So there's a relational backend schema we call Chato. There's a front end that's leveraging a content management system known as Drupal. So we sort of think of that as a very advanced wiki type system. And then it also has a set of modules. And these modules are developed by different, different members of the community to provide functionality that might be needed for many of these different databases. 
So it really reduces the time that's needed to set up such databases and get them out into the public domain. Because it's an open source system, there's a lot of developers working on this around the world. And in addition to that, we're also very concerned with user permissions um, and how this data is accessed, what's public, what's private, how it's stored. And so all of this functionality is actually built into the triple ecosystem. So we don't have to figure that out from scratch. Uh, so this is developed, uh, versions are released, and this is something that the community maintains um, for a lot of different genetic, genomic, breeding type databases around the world. So it supports a lot of different plant and some animal initiatives as well. So now we're going to talk a little bit about SPD and the reference systems, and these are being developed out of the triple ecosystem, much like tree genes is. SPD, as you know, is the service provider's directory. And this is the place where initial organization and institution registration takes place. Um, it's where public view of services and species available can be queried. It provides a portal to, uh, based on a login, being able to query information from the reference database. And it also, because of an API, application programming interface, uh, can communicate with the reference database, receive updates, and then update information on the SPD side. The reference database is gonna help manage the users within an institution and permissions. It's going to help also manage the data and how that's shared across organizations. It allows users to upload data and the associated metadata. It also allows users, if they have the permissions to do so, to edit data and metadata. It allows users to query this data and it also provides a lot of automatic checking of the data as well as manual curation of the data as it's inputted into the database. And so one of the goals of this system in developing what were originally kind of two different projects and have now come together as two interfaces that can communicate is to allow users to come in to log in, to provide information about themselves, their institutions, and the members of their institutions, but then also come in and provide the data itself. And this is all controlled through a login system. And as so depending on the permissions that are available, those users or associated users can browse reference data or simply browse the service providers directory. And so as you mentioned, there were a couple of meetings dedicated as well as many conversations and emails and, and calls to the community to ask about what the data requirements are for about four different primary um, data analysis types that we're interested in. Now, these are not the only uh, types that are available. If there's different um, and, uh, tools being used in the community, we're definitely open to hearing about those, getting some data requirements and including those in the system. But these were kind of the four targets initially. So wood anatomy, genetics, DART, and isotopes. And in each of these categories, we worked with the community to figure out what is the minimal reporting requirements for these systems? How do we want this data to be represented? What type of flexibility needs to exist depending on the institutions? Um, and what would we consider to be complete versus partial um, data submissions for these categories? Basically, what type of information would we need to be able to potentially validate this information or to share this information should it become available? And we've also spent a lot of time, as you'll see when Peter goes through his demos, of trying to make the, the uh, process of sending this information as flexible and straightforward as possible. But that's also something we want to seek input from the community on. If things are not um, easy to understand or easy to work through, or there's hurdles at any of these levels, um, that's something we're interested in helping with. And so our goal at all levels of this data submission pipeline is to try to get at both the metadata on either the sample or the original tree, as well as the downstream metadata on the analysis itself that might've been performed on that sample, subsamples from that tree or so on. So you might have information on say the georeferenced information on the original sample, species or, or genus identification, permit information, some type of tree identifier, or if it's in a collection, another type of identifier, so a barcode or internal IDs. And the system has the ability to help maintain that information. And then on the sample side, we might be interested in understanding what types of tissues we're working with, um, 
We might have DOIs associated with the uh, downstream analysis, field or lab technicians that have worked on that, and then of course the actual data from that analysis itself. And then we may even have information on storage. So the system has the ability to look at things like how is this particular sample tracked? I'm coming back again to this idea of having internal IDs or barcodes. If it's a physical wood sample, we also have the ability to keep track of the volume or dimensions on that sample if it's being subsampled or sent to other facilities for analysis. We can also keep track if we're, say, working with genetic data or DNA, we can ask, you know, uh, where is this information uh, uh, held? And we can use this to actually help institutions track their own information or to help them send information from a, a custom database they may have locally. So we could have information on freezers or shelves, barcode IDs, Xylarium locations, and so on. And so after we've collected a set of um, metadata and the type of data that one submits is gonna be sort of custom to what you start to work through and say that you have, you know, whether you're working with trees or you're working with wood samples or the type of analysis that you conduct on these samples. And so once that information is submitted and a user walks through that full submission pipeline, they have the opportunity to view all of that data again in a summarized view that information is sent for approval by an institution lead if one is designated as part of the permissions for that organization. That data is then integrated into the database once approved for uh, access that can be queried by those who have permission to query it. And then it's also going to go ahead and update that original service provider record, especially if new information has come in on a new species or a new analysis type. And so that public view of the service provider's record will say this organization, you know, can work on this particular species and this analysis type here. And so that information will come through upon approval of the data. And as I said, this kind of represents a combination of automated validations of the data, some of which are happening in real time while that data is being submitted, and then approvals that are done manually by individuals kind of in the pipeline. And so this is just the general view to note that the system will allow you to manage data access internally. And so this allows one to designate an institution lead or set of leads that have the ability to approve data submission from others within an organization. It allows you know, the division of subgroups within organizations if that's appropriate. It also allows designation of who can add and remove individuals from an institution as well. And so there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how internal data access can work within an organization. Um, our larger organizations may need, may need more resolution and smaller organizations may need less. But this is again, something that if there are specific needs with, within an institution or organization, we would love to hear that because it's likely something that we can set up with our more flexible uh, user permissions. In addition to sort of the internal access control within organizations or even across organizations within the system, we can also uh, control access publicly. And so this can be, you know, who can generally just query what species and analysis types are available, potentially what regions um, are uh, uh, have data available for them, or within each component, you can actually see this is the view for law enforcement, this is the view for institutions providing this type of data, specific institutions maybe may have access to this, or some data may be submitted and accessible just within an organization. And so ideally, we're hoping to get full submissions of data, data that can be verified, and data that can be made accessible to the key individuals who need it. Um, and so this is another aspect which can be modified at many different levels depending on the type of data available. And as a as sort of a final note, I just wanted to mention sort of going back to the beginning, this all of the system that we've developed is based on this triple infrastructure that's open source and we're leveraging relational models and how we're holding the data and how the data interacts on the back end. It very much follows the model that's used by a lot of plant-based genetic and trait databases that are out there. So tree genes, hardwood genomics, and genome database for rosacea are just a few examples of that. 
And when I showed cartography in the beginning, our application that brings together genotype, trait data, as well as environmental information, this is, can be back-ended by high-performance computing. And so there is the possibility in the future with this data being stored that users can also upload information and actually run analyses of their data against the existing data in the database. And we have the capability to provide that with data that's being shared or even against data that is just within a, a subset of the reference database. And so I just wanted to make note of that now that by leveraging these systems, there's a lot of capabilities moving forward as well. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Peter, who's gonna walk you through first the service providers directory and then move over to the reference side and talk more about that. Hey, thank you, Jill. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, okay, can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, my name is Peter Richter um, and I've been working uh, in conjunction with uh, Sergey and Simo on the, the two uh, components of the GTTM information system. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a presentation on both of those uh, components. Um, so first, I just want to give a quick outline of what I'll be covering today. Uh, first, I'll give a brief overview of the different components of the GTTN system and how those components interact with each other. Um, then I will go over the steps to register yourself in the service providers directory or SPD. Uh, then I will cover how to query for wood identification service providers and submit a request. Um, and then finally, I will show a uh, live demo of the reference database um, and cover some best practices for uploading sample data and metadata, uh, as well as the sharing and data integrity features that the reference data pipeline provides. Okay, so first, understanding the GTTN system. Um, the GTTN information system was co-developed between EFI and the Tree Genes Group at the University of Connecticut, uh, along with inputs from many experts within the GTTN network. Um, to understand the GTTN system, it's important to understand how the different components of the system interact with each other. Um, the system is split into two main components. Uh, the first is the reference database, or REF. Uh, which is hosted and maintained by the Tree Genes Group at University of Connecticut. Um, and the second is the Service Providers Directory, or SPD, uh, which is hosted and maintained by EFI. Uh, each component has different purposes, uh, but they are fully integrated with each other so that uh, users uh, will use the same email and login information to access both components. Um, the components have different features. So the SPD contains a list of service providers and their analysis capabilities and can be used to query for service providers within the GTTN network that are able to analyze a sample based on specified criteria. Um, and the REF contains verified reference data and metadata that's been submitted by members of the GTTN network. Um, and can be used to share data with flexibility or browse reference data that other service providers have made public to the rest of the GTTM network. Okay, so now I'm gonna cover how to register your organization uh, to the SPD. So before entering your lab contact information to the SPD, you'll need to create an account. Um, to do this, you can go to form.spd globaltimbertrackingnetwork.org slash registration. So you can see the link right here. Um, and you fill out the form for your laboratory. Uh, after you submit the form, you'll need to wait for approval from an EFI site administrator. Uh, this will be either Sergey, Simo, Yo, or Jose. After your account has been approved, uh, you can go to form.spd.globaltimbertrackingnetwork.org slash login.html. Um, and here you'll be able to enter your email and password. Um, and from, from here, you'll be able to actually enter your uh, registration details. Um, this login page is, I believe, still currently under maintenance, um, but should be uh, back up by the end of this week. Once you log in, 
uh, you'll be able to edit the details of your laboratory in the SPD. Um, so this is a four-step form which takes detailed information about the service provider in three major categories. Uh, the first is general information, the next is uh, analysis capabilities, and the third is quality indicators. Um, the form also contains a page of terms and conditions that the user must agree to in order to use the services provided by GTTN. Okay, so once your uh, information has been uh, submitted into the SPD, uh, your organization will start to show up in service provider queries. Um, so I'm going to cover now how to submit a service provider request. Um, so first you can go to form.spd.globaltimbertrackingnetwork.org slash query.php. Um, and from here, you'll be able to see the service provider query form. Uh, you can enter your name, your email, and the name of your organization. Um, and then the criteria for your service provider and submit a query to find service providers that meet your criteria. Um, so this screenshot shows the uh, form for querying for service providers uh, by location, um, but we also offer uh, queries for service providers by product. Um, note that this query has uh, different fields for uh, criteria than the uh, query by location form. So once you've filled out this form um, and you've run your query, uh, you'll see a list of service providers that meet your query criteria. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the service providers who've updated their information in the past year will appear at the top of the list and the date of their latest update will be displayed in the results. So that's that red text here. Um, from here, you can select the providers that you would like to submit a request to. Um, so those are providers will receive uh, an email message and you'll receive a copy of that message. So for example, um, this is a, a sample screenshot of a, of a service provider request message that you might receive. Um, note that it has the uh, name and email of the person sending the request, um, as well as the specific criteria that they entered in the search query form. Um, and so from here, the primary contact of an organization uh, can reply to uh, this person and either say, uh, yes, we can handle your request or no, we can't handle your request. Um, these are the reasons why. Okay, so that about covers uh, the SPD. I'm going to move on now to the uh, live demo of reference. Does anybody have any questions so far? <laughs> I will move on. So um, this is the, uh, the landing page of the pipeline to uh, submit your uh, reference data. Um, the demonstration that I'm doing today uh, is on the development site. Um, so everything is almost exactly the same on the production site, except for on the links here, um, instead of typing uh, 8080 after the domain name, uh, you'll just leave it as gtgn.treegenesdb.org. Okay, I'm going to zoom in a little just so that everybody can read the text. Okay. So this is the landing page to the reference database pipeline. Um, gtgn.treegenesdb.org slash gttn-tpps is uh, the, the link to get to this page. Um, so from here, uh, as long as you're logged in and you have an account, um, you can uh, submit your reference data. So once you get to this page, you'll be able to either uh, create a new GTTN tip submission, um, or you can uh, pick up where you left off on an old submission if you have those. Um, so today uh, I have a, a reference demo uh, submission prepared, so I'm just gonna use that one. Okay, so the first page here uh, covers a lot of uh, basic information about your submission. So that includes the submission name, uh, the reason you collected the data, um, the date that the analysis uh, took place, um, DOIs uh, that are related to your data, um, the original database URL, if the data came from uh, a different database originally, um, 
stuff like the, the project name. Uh, so like this would be either a uh, funding agency or grant number. Um, what's important from this section is that you select a, a submission type. Um, so this indicates the type of trees that you're uh, submitting, whether they're new or existing already in the database um, or a mix of those. Um, this is helpful for us uh, to decide whether or not um, uh, trees that uh, appear in multiple different submissions uh, truly are the same tree. Um, so if you're submitting all, all new trees to the database that haven't been analyzed yet, then you would put in new trees. Um, and if you have a, uh, a mix of new and existing, you would pick mix. And if you have all just existing trees that were in the database, you would choose um, existing trees. So today I'm submitting new trees. The next section is data permissions. So this uh, dictates who's going to be able to see your data um, once it's been submitted and approved. So there are a few uh, options here that are pretty flexible. Um, first is public. So this will be visible to uh, everybody who goes to the GTTN website. Um, all registered GTTN organizations. This of course shows the data with, uh, shares the data with uh, every other organization that is uh, part of the GTTN network. Law enforcement members only. Um, so this, uh, this selecting this option uh, would make your data only visible to uh, users who have the uh, law enforcement um, role. Select organizations. Um, so this is useful if you'd like to share your data with um, multiple organizations within the network, but not necessarily all of them. Um, and so from here, you can click as many organizations as you like, um, or you can just share it with the organization that your account is uh, actually paired with. Um, so for today, I'm just gonna share my data with this organization. Um, and then uh, <coughs> uh, there's finally a disclaimer here. Uh, it's a placeholder for right now, um, but it basically says that uh, you're, you're consenting to submit your data and have it be shared with the people that you said you're going to be sharing with. Okay. So the second page is the species information. Um, here you can add as many or as few uh, species as you'd like. Um, the species is autocomplete. Uh, so if I type in E, it autocompletes to any uh, species that start with E. Um, today I'm going to do Absolia Africana. Um, and then the data type section uh, where you select the different types of uh, it, whether you're whether you're giving us sample data or uh, the different types of reference data uh, that you'll be uploading today. Next. Okay, so this is the tree accession and sample information page. Um, this has two major sections. The first one is the tree accession information. Um, this is mostly just one file upload, um, but this is a dynamic file upload. So what that means is after you upload your file, uh, you'll see a preview of it. This is the first few rows of my Excel spreadsheet. Um, and in the columns of each of, of the preview, uh, there's a dropdown. And this, is, uh, this helps us decide uh, what data is in each column of your file. Um, this allows us to take in uh, a lot more different formats of files. Um, and we don't have to rely on uh, you know, like uh, regular expressions to try and guess what the types of data are in each column of your file. Um, so this uh, file upload requires a tree identifier column and uh, some location columns. So uh, we have the options for a tree identifier. You can uh, specify the location of each tree either with GPS coordinates like I have here uh, we also offer uh, options for specifying location via the country and state, uh, county, district. Um, you can specify a population group, and then you'll get a little section down here that uh, asks for the location of each population group uh, if, you're, if your trees are uh, grouped by location. Um, we also accept forest IDs and barcodes, um, and then there's an optional column for 
uh, species identification identification confidence score. So once you've selected uh, columns for your tree identifier and the locations of your trees, you can click this button um, and it allows you to see your trees on an interactive map. Um, so it's fully interactive. You can scroll around and zoom in and out. Um, and you can also click on individual data points to see the name of the tree that we think is at this location uh, as well as the location that we think it's at. Um, so this is super useful um, for uh, a quick check to make sure that none of your trees end up in like the ocean, for instance, because um, that doesn't usually happen. Um, that generally would mean that uh, there was a problem either with your file or we parsed it incorrectly. Um, so this is just a helpful way to, to a little sanity check. Okay. So next is the uh, sample information section. Um, this is pretty similar to the uh, tree accession information section, um, as it is mostly just a, a, a dynamic file upload. So similar to the tree accession portion, uh, after you upload your file, you'll get a preview, and then we just need to know uh, the types of data in each column. So for this this file upload, we need to have a uh, sample ID. Uh, we need to know what the uh, tissue type is of that sample. Um, we need to know the remaining dimensions or volume of that sample. Uh, we need to know who collected the sample, uh, what the source of the sample was. So this can either be um, a tree ID that matches a tree ID in your file that you submitted up here, um, or it can be the ID of another sample. Uh, so if you had like a sample coming from a sample, then you would just have to specify the ID of the sample that that one came from, if that makes sense. Um, the dimensions of the uh, sample, and then finally the sampling method. Um, and then after you've indicated all of that, uh, we just need a little bit more information about your samples, like uh, when the samples were collected, uh, whether or not they've been analyzed, uh, the storage location, so this can either be, uh, there will be a dropdown of registered GTTN organizations, or you can specify other uh, and put uh, a different storage location. Um, and then the technician name and email of the person who uh, collected the samples. And then finally down here, uh, this little box indicates whether or not these samples uh, can be shared with other people within the GTTN network. Um, and this will come in, come in handy later uh, when we talk about uh, data certifications. Okay, next. Okay, so this is the final page of the uh, pipeline that actually has you inputting data um, and it's the largest page. Um, so this is where you'll, you'll enter your actual raw analysis data. So that includes your DART data, isotope data, anatomy data, or uh, genetic data. So at the top, um, is a little checkbox that indicates whether or not the reference data for this submission uh, should use the same permissions as the rest of the submission. Um, so if I were to uncheck this, uh, it would have um, a, a uh, option to either select different organizations um, that can see this data or restrict it to only the current organization. Um, so if I was to switch to only the current organization, then the metadata for this study, so the, the information about the species, the type of data, uh, the location of the trees, uh, the name of the submission, all that would still be visible, um, but the actual raw data would only be visible to uh, the current organization. Um, but for now, I wanna keep the same uh, visibility permissions. Um, you can also select to, uh, not provide uh, the reference data for this submission. So if you wanted to indicate that the submission had DART data, but you don't want to upload it to the GTTN reference database, then you can click this box here uh, and skip DART data. Uh, and this, uh, this option exists uh, for all of the different uh, data types. So isotope, genetic, and anatomy also have a box like this at the top of each section. Um, and it all works the same way, okay? So 
first I'm going to cover the Dart uh, reference data. Um, there are two uh, files that need to be uploaded here. So the first is the Dart metadata spreadsheet. Um, this should uh, have, it's a dynamic file upload, as you can see, the preview and the different uh, column data types. Um, for this file, we need to know uh, the name of the analysis lab, uh, the spectra ID, the spectra gather, the type of Dart TOFMS, um, the parameter settings for that Dart run, uh, the calibration type for that Dart run, um, and the sample ID that that Dart run uh, is, is uh, associated with. Um, then we need uh, an archive of the uh, raw Dart data. Um, so I can show you um, what that looks like. Okay, here we go. So this is the archive that I have uploaded here. Um, it should be a single folder uh, that contains a bunch of text files. Um, each text file should have, should be named uh, the sample id.txt. So for example, this one, TW58, uh, matches the sample id uh, up here uh, for that Dart run. And then in each text file, uh, there will be a couple lines of uh, calibration information followed by uh, the actual raw uh, Dart data. Um, so if you format this archive correctly, then when you upload it, uh, the, the pipeline system will uh, extract it um, and uh, be able to parse through all of this data and then uh, load it into the database properly. Okay, that covers Dart data. Next is isotope reference data. Um, <clears throat> first, we need to know uh, whether or not an increment core was used for sampling. Um, and if it was, we need to know the length of that increment core. Um, then we need to know all the different isotopes uh, that were used. Uh, so today I'm using uh, 13C and 18O. Um, for each isotope that you used, we need to know the standard um, and the isotope type, whether it's whole wood or cellulose. And then finally, we need to know the, uh, the, we need to have the actual isotope raw data. Um, so for this file, um, we offer two different formats um, that you can upload your spreadsheet. Um, the first uh, contains a unique sample ID followed by all of the isotope data for that sample ID uh, separated out by columns. Um, the second, uh, the sample ID, ID may appear more than once um, and there's only isotope data uh, for one isotope in each row. Um, the reason we offer both of these formats is we found that uh, lots of people had files uh, of the type one format and lots of people had files of the type two format. Um, and so we figured we would uh, just try to accommodate both of those. Um, so for today, I'm using type one. So I just need to indicate the column with my sample ID um, and the columns for my uh, two different isotope types um, that I am submitting today. Um, and then I'm done with isotopes. Okay, next is the uh, genetic reference uh, data information. Um, so today I'm just using uh, SSRs. Uh, if I select SNPs or other uh, genetic markers, um, I'll get a bunch of different uh, questions, but for today, I'm just going to use SSRs. Um, for SSRs, we need to know the sequencing, uh, the name of the SSR sequencing instrument, um, the ploidy of the species that this SSR run uh, was done on, um, and then the actual uh, genotype assay uh, file. Um, then uh, optional fields include the, the description of the SSR marker, um, the DNA quality, uh, and the DNA extraction method. Okay, so finally is uh, the anatomy section. Um, first, these, uh, this section is the anatomical characteristics. Um, this uh, is a bunch of metadata about uh, the, the species that you've indicated you're uploading anatomy data for. Um, these uh, sections were all uh, provided to us by uh, an anatomy expert within the uh, 
GTTN network. Um, but these are all optional, so I'll skip them for now. Uh, the part that's not optional is the microscope slides. Um, so this is where you'll actually upload your, your uh, microscope slide pictures. Uh, so you can upload the file. Um, we require a, a short description of the slide image that you're uploading, um, and then you can optionally add a, a photo credit um, to, to put the name of the person that uh, took the picture. Okay. So once you've got all that data entered, uh, you can click review information and submit. Um, and so now uh, it will bring you to a, a summary page. So you're not quite done yet. Uh, this, this page is just uh, similar to the, the thumbnail map on the uh, tree accession page. Um, this is just a, a sanity check to look over and make sure that all your data looks correct. The submission name, uh, the reason for the submission, uh, the number of trees, um, and we intend to add a little bit more information like the uh, number of dart runs or uh, number of genetic markers or isotopes uh, that we found um, just to make sure that all the numbers uh, look right. Once you've verified that all of this information is correct, um, you can click submit. Um, and then you'll just need to wait for um, approval from the primary contact uh, of your organization. Um, I happen to be primary contact of my organization. Um, so this is the uh, primary contact approval panel. Um, so from here you can see uh, submissions that have already been approved as well as uh, new submissions that are pending approval. Um, so as you can see, my demo submission is pending approval. If I click on the accession number, I can see the same summary page uh, that the user saw before, um, and I can go through the data uh, and verify that all of it makes sense. Um, if there's a problem with the data, uh, I can type a reason uh, for rejecting the data in here um, and click reject, and that will send an email out to the user and ask them to resubmit. Um, or if the data looks good, I can check this box and click approve. And that should submit a job to actually uh, uh, load the data into the database. Um, so it should only take about a minute. Okay, it's completed. So now my data is uh, loaded into the uh, database. So if I navigate over to gtn.treegenesdb.org slash reference, um, this is the browse reference data page. Um, so now if I refresh this page, you can now see that the submission that I just uh, created with Axelia Africana and all these different data types uh, appears on the browse reference data page. Um, so this page is good for uh, searching for different types of data. So you can search by uh, project name, submitting organization, species, data type, uh, or tissue type. Um, so for example, if I wanted to search for uh, all the submissions with the word demo uh, in the name, I can do that and my demo one comes up or uh, test in the name, all the ones with test in the name come up here. Um, you can also use this page to search for uh, samples. Um, so if you just use a blank search, it'll load up all the samples uh, that are available in the uh, reference database. You can search by sample ID uh, the species of the sample uh, or the tissue type and that works that works uh, similar to the uh, reference data submission search. Um, for now I'm just going to show the reference data browse. Um, so once you find uh, the submission that you're looking for you can click on either the accession number or the project name um, and this will bring you to a details page um, where you can see a map that is uh, similar to the thumbnail but uh, blown up a little more. Um, you can still click on the trees to see uh, their names and locations. Um, and then down here, these tabs show you uh, more detailed information about the study. Um, so as you can see, you can see the, the uh, name of the submission, uh, who submitted it, and through what organization. Um, you can click to show the, the reason the data was uh, collected. 
Um, you can download uh, an archive of all of the raw files for the submission. Um, and then from these tabs, you can see more detailed information. For example, the species information, uh, the details about the study, uh, such as the accession number, the project name, who submitted it, uh, the species that were involved, uh, the different data types. Uh, you can download individual files if you don't want to download uh, the full uh, raw archive. Um, and you can also see statistics like the number of trees, samples, and dart reads. Um, the trees tab shows you uh, detailed information about each of the trees, including the identifier, the species, and the location. Uh, the samples tab shows you information about the samples, um, et cetera. From the DART tab, you can download the raw uh, DART read files. Um, the isotope tab is still under construction. The genetic data shows you detailed information about each of the genetic markers. Um, and then on the anatomy tab, you can see the actual microscope slides uh, that were uploaded. Um, so now I want to show uh, how to edit data. Um, so let's see, remember. So to edit your uh, submission, say I forgot, or say that I, uh, you know, created my submission, it got approved and loaded into the database, and then I got news that, oh no, uh, all of the, the samples here uh, that I submitted were not actually Apsilia africana, but they were a different species. Um, for situations like that, we have an edit page. So if you go to gtn.treegenesdb.org, slash gtn dash tpps slash edit, and then your accession number of your submission, uh, you can edit information about your submission. Um, right now, we only offer uh, the ability to edit your submission name and the species, either submission-wide or of individual samples, uh, but we intend to expand this edit page in the future. Um, so you can at this page, you can either switch the species for your entire submission, or if only a couple of the samples were misidentified, uh, you can switch the, the species for just those samples by clicking individual samples. Um, but today I just wanna edit uh, the, the species for the entire submission. So I can change it from Apsley Africana to this uh, species, and I can click Submit. Um, this will submit a job similar to the, uh, the original approval uh, job that should just take about a minute to run. Still waiting. Okay. All right, now it should be complete. So if we go back to uh, the reference data, you can see that now uh, my demo submission, instead of being an Absolia Africana submission, uh, has changed to this species. Um, and if I click on the submission details link, now you can see the species is this species instead of Absolia Africana. Um, and all of the trees are now uh, this species rather than Absolia Africana. And the same is true for the uh, samples for this submission. Um, the last thing that I wanna talk about um, is the uh, data certifications. Um, so you might have noticed that right next to the names of each submission are these two little indicators. Um, the first, th these indicators uh, will show up for any submission that is uh, approved and loaded into the reference database. Um, the first, will be either a lock or an unlock. Um, the lock means that uh, the metadata uh, for this submission is stored on the database. Um, whereas the unlock means that both the metadata and the raw reference data are stored in the database. And then the other indicator is this little share icon. The green one means that um, samples used in the submission can be requested or shared by other organizations within the GTTN network. 
um, and then the red indicator means that uh, samples uh, used in the submission cannot be requested uh, or shared by um, other organizations within the network. Um, and I believe that covers everything. Um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs>